Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you all this weekend. My wife and I uh, have enjoyed getting to know some of you and also um, uh, the hospitality, being cared for, uh, the good food on Friday night cooked by your pastors, um, and also uh, the fellowship that we've had as brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you so much for caring for us. Um, of course, I've had a long-term relationship with this church uh, from its very inception when I was um, on the Mission to North America Committee of our presbytery. I drove down from, from Statesboro uh, to teach a Bible study here to gather a group together so that this church could get started. So it's great to be here now some many, many, well, 40 years later about um, and see you here ministering in this community and to, to also worship with you and have the chance to minister to you. Um, this weekend we talked about, um, about marriage and um, we've talked about what marriage is, a dominion-oriented covenant of companionship. If you want to find out what I mean by that, you'll have to listen to the, uh, the recording or talk with your pastors about it. Uh, but when we enter into our marriage, we establish a binding covenant uh, between a man and a woman uh, of companionship that has an outward focus to the spread of the dominion of Christ our Lord. And that allows us then to establish a peculiar relationship different from any relationship that exists between human beings on the face of the earth, that of the husband and wife relationship. And in that relationship, there are peculiar broad stroke duties that a husband has toward his wife, a wife has toward her husband. So we talked about both uh, just in broad strokes, what, what it looks like to be a husband, what it looks like to be a wife. And then this morning, I want us to think about uh, how it is that relationships grow, how they flourish and prosper as we focus on what the Bible tells us about uh, communication, open, honest, and truthful communication, the stuff that relationships thrive upon. It's through that communication pipeline that we share our lives with one another and that our relationship grows. Now, the Bible has a whole lot to say about <clears throat> the words that we speak, both positively and negatively, and um, we're just going to look at a few things. Uh, this is not really an exposition of a particular text, but uh, rather the concept of what it means for us to speak words of truth in an open and honest way to one another. So we're looking at several verses, Ephesians 4, uh, verse 15, also verse 25, verse 29, all of which address the issue of our uh, speech, but also a number of other passages in the Scripture as well. So if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, uh, we're going to read just three verses, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord to bless our study this morning. Verses 15, 25, and also 29. Hear now the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Ephesians 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Then skip down to verse 25. Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then skip down to verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we now pray for the work of your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ and to grant us, O Lord, uh, understanding of your word. We know that your word tells us the natural man cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually appraised. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, for the work of your spirit 
to enlighten our minds, to grant us understanding, and grant us also, Father, the courage to apply the truth that we understand to our lives. Grant us hearts that desire to obey you. And we pray, Father, that you would transform us from uh, the inside out, that we might reflect the glory of the very Savior himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, those who study the art of communication tell us um, about 7% of what we communicate is verbal in nature, that is, the actual words that we speak. And then another 38% or so is in the tone of our voice. And then another 55% or so is nonverbal, our body language, so to speak. So you've often uh, experienced this, I'm sure. You look at someone, they look like they're dejected, and you say to them, what's wrong? And they respond, nothing. Now, you heard the word nothing. That was the verbal aspect, the 7%. But everything else was telling you not nothing, but something. Something is not right. There are at least these three factors to consider. What you meant to say, what you actually said, and what you were understood to say. So perhaps you've heard this phrase. It sort of sums it all up. I know that you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Sometimes that's the way we feel, isn't it? There was a story told about a woman, uh, she was a rather old-fashioned lady who was planning a couple of weeks vacation in Florida, and uh, she was kind of delicate in her speech and elegant with her language, Uh, so she was writing a letter to the campground to which she would be visiting, and she wanted to make sure to find out about the... um, kinds of uh, facilities that were there at the campground. She wanted to know if it was fully equipped, what were the toilet facilities like, the bathroom, and all that before she committed herself to go. So she couldn't bring herself, though, because of her delicate nature to use the word toilet in her letter. And so uh, after a lot of thought and deliberation, she finally came up with the old-fashioned term bathroom commode. She would then write the letter to them and ask them what kind of bathroom commode uh, is available in the campground facilities, and uh, then she would be able to make a decision. Uh, But when she wrote down the word bathroom commode, even that didn't seem right. It just was a little bit tacky to her. It just jumped off the page wrong, and so she thought, no, I can't write that. Uh, And so she tried to figure out what else she might be able to say. So finally she came to the conclusion she would just uh, use the initials B.C. What kind of B.C. does the campground have? Well, the campground owner uh, was not old-fashioned at all. And then uh, when he got the letter, he's trying to figure out what in the world is this woman asking him? What is she trying to communicate by the two initials, the two letters, uh, B.C.? It just stumped him. And so after worrying about it for several days and not sure about what this woman was asking, how he might reply, he went to some of the other uh, campers, the other staff there, and see if they could help him. They couldn't figure it out either. And so finally, after much thought, the campground owner uh, came to the conclusion that What the lady was asking him about was the location of the local Baptist church, B.C. And so he sat down to write her an answer uh, to her inquiry, and he began this way, Dear Madam, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but now I take pleasure of informing you that in the B.C., that this B.C. is located nine miles north of the campsite and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. I admit it is quite a distance away, 
if you're in the habit of going regularly. But no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. And it was so crowded, we had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that right now there is a supper planned to raise money to buy more seats. They plan to hold the supper in the middle of the B.C. so everyone can watch and talk about this great event. I would like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. But it is surely not for lack of desire on my part. As we grow older, it seems to be more and more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. If you decide to come down to the campground, perhaps I could go with you the first time you go and sit with you and introduce you to the other folks. This is a really very friendly community. Now, of course, the great challenge um, before us in any relationship is to communicate to one another and to be understood and uh, to be able to really have accurate, open, truthful communication with one another. Relationships grow and thrive and flourish on the basis of open, honest, and truthful communication. And a marriage relationship between a husband and wife is going to grow only insofar as the pipelines of communication are kept open and clear and clean between the two persons. Now, of course, the great challenge for that is uh, uh, that uh, we have a great communication problem as fallen human beings. Uh, we are sinners, and thus we have a communication problem. Before sin entered the human experience, there would have been no such problem, though. If you can imagine just for a moment, Adam and Eve living in the Garden of Eden, before any sin entered the world, and them conversing with one another. Uh, the Bible tells us that the Lord himself would be with them in the cool of the evening, and they would have this opportunity to, to be together and this full, free, open, truthful, honest exchange of communication between man and woman and fellowship with God. They would have been able to communicate with one another without any difficulties whatsoever, without the fear of being misunderstood, without the challenge of being offended by some kind of statement made that was inappropriate in some way or another, without the fear or the obstacles that sinners have in communicating with one another without the difficulties of a fallen, self-centered nature. But of course, when sin entered into the world, into the human experience, all of that changed. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 13, uh, we read about uh, sin and the impact it had upon the exchange of a relationship between man and woman. It was by sin perverted and destroyed and gravely damaged. First, there was perverted communication that entered into the world. Uh, verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3 of Genesis tells us, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God made. He said to the woman, Did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent lies and perverts God's word, making God's instructions appear to be more restrictive than they truly are. Uh, did not God say you can't eat of any tree of the garden? And of course, what God says you, is you can eat of all of the trees of the garden except for one. 
Then the woman misquotes uh, the scripture and adds to God's word. She makes it more restrictive than it actually was. She says, the Lord said, you cannot eat of the fruit or touch it. Now, it might be better if you don't touch it. If you don't touch it, you wouldn't have to worry about eating it. But strictly speaking, God did not say you cannot touch it. He just said you cannot eat it. And then the serpent actually contradicts God's word in verses 4 and 5, saying, no, you will not surely die, but rather your eyes will be opened. Of course, exactly the opposite took place, and they were struck with a spiritual blindness that pervades mankind to this very day. Not only was the communication perverted, and we have this great challenge, but also it was to some extent destroyed. Uh, verses 6 to 13 tell us, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked and they became self focused. And so they tried to cover themselves up. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They become self-conscious, self-focused, and they hear the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, <clears throat> and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Note that now there is shame covering themselves. There is fear hiding themselves from God, from one another. And note there is now guilt and also blame. All of this sin and conflict clogs up the communication pipeline and as a result, it prevents the relationship from growing and progressing and prospering. That's why in every relationship, the problem of sinful communication must be resolved. Sin must be confessed. Forgiveness must be sought. Forgiveness must be granted. Conflicts must be resolved or the relationship will not grow. So you get married, your communication pipeline is fairly clean and you have some free exchange and then you start sinning against one another, thought, word, and deed. And uh, that sinful conflict that takes place in the relationship is not acknowledged, it is not confessed, forgiveness is not asked for, forgiveness is not granted. And after 20 years or so of uh, piling up one unresolved conflict after the other, you've got this veritable mountain of unresolved conflicts in your relationship, and the pipeline is clogged up. It's like plaque in your coronary arteries. And then suddenly there's a heart attack in the marriage relationship and the marriage is dead. So there's perverted communication and there's communication that's destroyed as a result of the conflict, the shame, the fear, the guilt, the blame. And then there's also this damaging and corrupt communication that becomes um, 
part of the very life of the marriage itself. And the scripture is full of warnings and instructions about the corruption of our speech and the damage that it causes in our relationships, not just our marriage relationships, not just the relationships we have between husbands and wives, but also parents and children and every other area of life uh, that we experience. So Jesus warned about um, that which comes out of the mouth. Matthew 15, verse 18. The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. In Proverbs 18, verse 21, death and life are in uh, the power of the tongue. In Proverbs 12, verse 18, there is he that speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. And there's the warning of James, uh, chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, and the very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which it defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Some of the greatest damage that is done to a man's soul is caused by harsh and hateful and corrupt words spoken in hatred. And unfortunately, they often come out of the mouth of a husband toward his wife and a wife toward her husband. Slander, gossip, rumor, name calling, and on and on it goes. <clears throat> the ninth commandment is the commandment that governs our speech. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The ninth commandment addresses the need for truth in all of our communications. The bearing of a false witness is to be contrasted with the bearing of a true witness. If you want to find out more about that as it's... Um, filled out in its varied applications, look at the larger catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith, where it treats both that which the Ninth Commandment requires of us and also that which it prohibits. Bearing a false witness is what we normally call lying. Lying and deceiving speech is a great source of trouble and heartache in our lives. It is at the foundation of all betrayal, all treachery, all mistrust, all broken relationships. It is the companion to adultery and the first cousin to murder. It is at the core of fallen, our fallen condition of the human race. And you and I, as a result of our fallen nature, of our sin nature of the corruption with which we are born with, inherited from our father Adam, are prone to lie. We don't have to teach children to lie. They will come about it very naturally and very easily and become very skilled at it <clears throat> very quickly. Every one of us is to some extent or another a liar. Now, I don't say this as a means of making you feel better about your condition before God. Well, we're all liars, you know, so it's not really anything too bad, you know, we just like everybody else. <clears throat> as though the fact that everyone has the same terminal illness could make it less deadly. 
The reason that I state that we are all liars is because it is a true evaluation of our sin-ravaged hearts. And unless we recognize that, we won't get at the root of the problem with a lot of our marriage difficulties. You and I, as a result of our sin nature, are prone to lie. It is the essence of the sin nature to lie. In fact, the very beginning of this of sin in this world is intertwined with lies. The road leading to the fall of man was paved with the asphalt of lies and the sticky tar of deceit. When Satan came to Adam and Eve, as we've already noted, he used half-truths, misstatements of fact, and out-and-out deceit to undo them. The ninth commandment reminds us of the requirement of our God. He is pure, unadulterated truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You are made after his image, and as image bearers, it is our du duty to be as truthful as our Creator and reflect his truth to everything around us in all of our communication one with another. We are made in his image. Now it's one thing to recognize the problem in the broad strokes, that is that we are corrupt and that we are prone to lie, but it is yet another to recognize how it works out in the details of our lives. So I want you to note that there are many and married very motivations for lying that captivate us. You might be uh, motivated to lie in order to cover up other sins. That's often what takes place. Um, we lie in order to obfuscate, to cover up, to hide our sin. If a man commits murder, he may seek to cover up the murder by lying about where he was at the time of the murder. Where were you at five o'clock? And he has some made up alibi, a lie to cover up his murder. A man steals something, he may lie when questioned about the crime. Did you steal this item? No, I did not. <clears throat> this is what Aaron did when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the people were dancing around this golden calf and he said, look, what is, what's going on? What are you doing? And he said, uh, the people demanded it and they gave me their jewelry. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Sometimes the reason we're motivated to lie to cover up our sin, but it is futile, of course, to try and cover up our sin before the Lord God Almighty because he knows all things. Nothing is hid from the all-seeing eye of um of the omniscient God. And it is said of Jesus in John 2, 24 to 25, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man for he knew what was in a man. That's why we are told as believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And when we confess our sins, the word confess literally means to say the same thing as we are not telling God something he does not already know. We are agreeing with him concerning what we have done. We are acknowledging that yes, what I said or what I did was wrong and sinful and displeasing in your sight. And I'm asking for forgiveness. You may be motivated to lie in order to gain acceptance. Uh, there are certain people in your life that you want to accept you. Or sometimes you may be tempted to lie in order to gain their acceptance or to keep their acceptance. You don't want to lose it. I'm not going to tell you the truth about me. I'm not going to tell you the truth about this situation you're asking me about because I don't want to lose uh, respect in your eyes. I want to save face in your eyes. And so I want to make myself look better 
than I am. I don't want to be honest about my sin. So we stretch the truth. We call it stretch the truth. Isn't it interesting, the little the statements we have? Stretch the truth. Or maybe you're motivated to lie in order to get what you want. You misrepresent yourself on an application so that you can get a loan. Or you could lie about your age so you can get some sort of license. Or lie to someone in order to give you what you want. Self-serving, destroying trust and relationship because of corrupt communication that is untruthful. Or you may lie because you're motivated to get back at someone, uh, to spread a lie about someone in order to hurt them. This is what the chief priests and the Pharisees did toward Jesus when they could not find something to accuse him of. They made up things against him. And we are told in Mark 14, 55 to 59, Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. They conflicted with one another. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple in three days and build another not made by man. But their testimony did not agree. Or maybe you might lie in order to escape responsibilities. It wasn't my responsibility uh, or I didn't have time to do it, or it's someone else's fault. I didn't hear you, Mom, when you said clean up your room, but really I just didn't want to do it. And all of this corrupt communication that has uh, deception at its heart then destroys communication and thus destroys relationship and this kind of communication will destroy a marriage. So this is our communication problem. Is it insurmountable? No, it's not. Not as long as there is a gospel, the good news of a God who reconciles sinners to himself, who takes liars and forgives them and embraces them and begins to transform them into truth tellers. The solution is the transforming power of the gospel. That's why we've said all this weekend that really um, your marriage, whether or not it's a good marriage, a strong Christian marriage or not is all about the gospel. It's all about the life-changing, transforming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about you personally and intimately uh, establishing a relationship with the living God, your creator, through the Lord Jesus Christ, who takes your sin upon himself, every lie you've ever taken, the man who was pure, unadulterated truth became, as it were, a liar in the presence of the God of truth that you might be redeemed and cleanses it from your soul that you might be reconciled to this God of truth and know him as your heavenly father. Your marriage is all about that gospel. By the gospel, Jesus has taken away our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, and removed it from us. We are no longer in need of hiding from God or from each other. He breaks the stronghold of sin in our hearts and works humility in the place of pride. When we are converted, the Lord Jesus changes everything about us, including our speech our communication. And we can begin to be open and honest and truthful in our communication without fear of God rejecting us 
and we can learn to be open and honest and truthful with one another and with our mates, our husband or our wife, without fear of being rejected by them and knowing that God accepts us even if they might not. As believers, we would now be able to speak the truth to one another in love. And that's the Apostle Paul's command to us as brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as husband and wife in Christ. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects in Him who is the head, even Christ. Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are no longer enslaved by sinful patterns of communication. We have been renewed by the grace of God and are being transformed into the image of Jesus. Thus the Apostle Paul exhorts us in Ephesians 4 verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. This is the byproduct of the gospel at work in the heart of husband and wife. If you're a growing believer, you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you are receiving grace from Him, you're confessing your sin and He's cleansing you, you're walking with Him, as it says in 1 John 1, verse 7, as we walk with Him, He is in the light, as we walk with Him in the light, as we're walking with Him, the blood of Jesus cleansing, cleanses us of all our sin. We're in relationship with Christ, we're confessing our sins, acknowledging them, seeking forgiveness, He's granting us forgiveness, we have this relationship with our Heavenly Father. It is a relationship in which we experience the rich, immeasurable grace of God extended to us without measure, without limit. And then we turn around and we extend that grace to our mate just as freely as we have received it. That's the gospel. The grace of God will make you less self-focused, more focused upon others. It'll make you a better communicator, willing to stop and to listen to others. It will give you some guidelines by which to evaluate your speech toward your mate. Ephesians 4.29 is a good, it's a good, um, test for everything that comes out of your mouth is a good test. Ask yourself, this is a fourfold test that you can apply to all your speech, but especially to your mate. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Here's a full fourfold test. Is it wholesome? Is what you're saying wholesome? Is it pure? Number two, will it build up or is it tearing down? Number three, is it appropriate? Is this the time to say it and is this the place to say it? Sometimes, you know, you hear about something like your, your kid did, you know, and you're just waiting for a chance to, 
let him have it. And the only time you have a chance to let him have it is when he sits down at the table for dinner and then the bomb gets dropped. Is that the right time and the right place to confront someone with their, someone with their sin? Is it appropriate? And lastly, will it give grace? That it may give grace to those who hear. Now this is our hope in the gospel. It is the restoring power of Jesus in the gospel. So that as we are aware the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we are aware that in some way we have spoken harshly or unkindly or in some ungodly way to our mate and um, we are convicted of our sin. We go to our mate and we say, honey, you know what? What I said to you was not pleasing to God. It was impatient. It was sinful for me to call you that name. And I need to know, will you please forgive me? And grace Having been forgiven by my Heavenly Father, I'm asking for forgiveness from my wife. And my wife, being my sister in Christ, looked at me and says, because you know she's a sinner. She says, yes, honey, I forgive you. And the pipeline is clean. And we keep it clean. We don't carry around 30 years worth of unresolved conflicts however little they might be. You know, plaque doesn't have to be a big chunk. It needs to be little plaque, little plaque, just added up over 30 years until you squeeze the capacity of the artery to carry any blood through to the heart and to the other organs of your body. And so it's all about the gospel. Jesus is the perfect embodiment of what it means to communicate openly, honestly, truthfully. He is the Word of God incarnate. He is the perfect communication of God, from God to us. In Him there is no hypocrisy or falsehood, no deceit. He always speaks wholesome words, always to build us up, always appropriate and always full of grace. John 6, 63, Jesus says, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. May it be so in our communication to one another as husbands and wives. Maybe what you need to do is sit down and take some account of the, what you've spoken to your wife or your husband and say to them, Honey, I've sinned against you in the way that I've spoken to you. Will you please forgive me? May God grant you the courage to do it and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as we pray together.